There's an interesting fact heard throughout television and fiction. But it isn't until we reached human beings at the top of the animal chain that we finally see a species use more of its cerebral capacity. You know how you only use 10% of your brain? We discovered that your inferior species uses only 10% of your brain. It seems like a good idea, and it feels like it could be true. But what if that fact were false? What is the science of the 10% myth? Hello Internet, and welcome to the Science Of. Using sci-fi and the news to educate people on how science actually works here in the real world. There are many cases of fiction claiming that we only use 10% of our brains. And if we could only unlock that other 90%, we could do wonders that we cannot conceive of right now with that mere 10%. Sometimes it's a comical point with those who use drugs. And you know how they say that we can only access 20% of our brain? Oh, what this does? It lets you access all of Other times, it's through a medical procedure. We discovered that your inferior species uses only 10% of your brain, so we filled it all the way up with star charts to see what would happen. What happened? It leaked. But there is one case where it is integral to the plot of a sci-fi story. But it isn't until we reached human beings at the top of the animal chain that we finally see a species use more of its cerebral capacity. The summary of the plot is that a sketchy boyfriend type forces his girlfriend type to make a sketchy delivery to a drug warlord, who forces her to deliver it to another country in her stomach. And idiot thugs start kicking her in the stomach mid-transport, and those drugs are released through her body to her brain through biology magic. Yeah, because that's totally how biology works. Sure thing. It does look cool though. And as those drugs cause an increasing amount of her brain to be accessible, she gets more and more well versed in both being creepy as shit. I remember the taste of your milk in my mouth. And say she eating her need for retribution against the drug boss for her torment. And at the end of it all, she gives herself up to have neurological evolutionary biologist Morgan Freeman to gain all of the insight he's looking for as to the purpose of us being here on Earth. Now you know what to do with it. Any neurobiologist, a scientist who studies the brain, will tell you that this particular plotline has no basis in reality and for plenty of reasons. Let me start at the beginning of the logic behind the sentiment and let me guide you through the logic the best I can. And as always, links and references are in the description. The first bit of logic comes from evolution. Any new trait which has evolved will either propagate through the generations because it is useful for survival, or it is wiped out because it hinders the species' ability to survive long enough to reproduce. It stands to reason that any evolutionary trait which allows those members of the species to survive long enough to reproduce is being used either to a great degree or to its fullest capacity. The human brain is one of those traits which was passed down through the generations because it has been used well enough to aid in the survival of those individuals who first came about that big brain trait from evolution. Our use of it back then would have been more than 10% of its capacity in order for the trait to survive more than a couple of generations, let alone the past quite a few millennia we've had it. Any trait that gives an evolutionary advantage would allow an individual to survive until reproduction age would be sought after by members of that species and bred into the genetics of future generations. Those traits that prove detrimental to our survival would cause those same individuals to die before they're old enough to reproduce and would therefore be bred out of our genetics. The bigger brain falls under the prior case and therefore would be used to a much greater capacity than Morgan Freeman and Scarlett Johansson would have us believe. The other piece of logic is the fact that our brains take up 2 to 3 percent of the mass of the human body, while it consumes around 20 percent of the energy used by the body. What is she doing? She's looking for energy and matter. And she's trying to connect with our computers. This is way too high of an energy consumption for the mass and the quoted 10 percent of brain usage. Consider this. The two big contributing factors of how much or how little energy a part of the body uses are, one, 
How much of that body part is present? The more of it there is, the more energy it uses. And two, how intensely that body part does its thing. The more intense its job, the more energy it uses. For the brain, it is already well established how much of it there is relative to the body, since we've been making that measurement for centuries now. This means that the common perception of the brain use intensity being 10% is way too low. Since our understanding of the inner workings of the brain is quite low, it stands to the reason that the common knowledge of the 10% rule is wrong. Yeah, great. Nice hypotheticals, I hear you say through your computer screen, because I'm magic like that. Do you have any observational facts to back up these fanciful hypotheses of yours? After all, logic and hypothesis are all fine, good, and dandy and all, but they've been proven wrong plenty of times before. As it so happens, in the past decade, the increase in the use of MRI has given us the observational evidence we are looking for. The basic concept is that an electromagnetic field is applied to the brain, and when a part of the brain is active, blood rushes to that part of the brain. Since the blood is rich in iron, which is a paramagnetic atom, it is affected by the electromagnetic field produced by the MRI. We can see the, the energy of the iron being affected by that field, which is the lights you see in the MRI screen. A litany of scientific studies so good. use the MRI to probe which parts of the brain are associated with which particular thoughts, stresses, sensations, emotional states, biological processes, and conversations, among other stimuli. Each scientific study has produced various parts of the brain being lit up in different combinations and under various circumstances. But if you look at all of these studies together, we have observational confirmation that each and every single part of the brain is used for one function or another. We are nowhere near halfway complete in studying the brain and how it works for all stimuli for all groups of people, but we have well more than enough information to have observational proof of concept that we use 100% of our brains at one point or another throughout the typical week. So yes, we use more than 10% of our brains. In fact, we use all of it. There's no doubt about that now. The big question in this particular field is exactly and precisely how these different parts of the brain connect to one another in any given situation. Next time on the Science of Sci-Fi. I propose that we build a robot who can love. So subscribe to stay informed. Don't forget to like, favorite, and share this video. Follow me on social media. Links in the description. And as always, until next time, keep learning, keep growing, and keep improving the world around you.